Hello, and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography Department here at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Amani Willett as tonight's guest speaker. Based in Brooklyn, Amani graduated in 2012 from the SVA MFA in Photography, Video, and Related Media program. In addition to his artistic practice, he teaches photography at Mass Art in Boston. Working primarily with the book form, his two most recent monographs have been published to widespread critical acclaim. The first book, The Disappearance of Joseph Plummer, tracks a mythical hermit, hermit's overgrown trail through the woods of central New Hampshire while simultaneously exploring our human desire to escape the burdens of modern society. While Disquiet is a meditation on s starting a family in a time of social unrest and uncertainty in America. How timely. Okay. Both books were selected by PhotoEye as best books of the year and have been highlighted in over 50 publications, including PDN, Lens Culture, Hyperallergenic, and noted by well respected artists and critics, including Todd Hedo, Elizabeth Biondi, and York Kohlberg. Willett's photographs are also featured in the books Bystander, A History of Street Photography, Street Photography in New York, and many numerous other publications. Amani, we're thrilled that you're here. Our students are now working on their books, so this timing could not be better. And we welcome what you have to share. Please help me welcoming Amani Willett. So I thought I'd start tonight by reading a short statement about my work. And I'll do that now. The focus of my most recent projects are lyrical transformations of reality that probe history, family, memory, and place. My impulse is not simply to document or record, but to create rich, atmospheric, impressionistic stories. All of my projects begin with strong personal connections, which then connect to universal conversations about relationships in the modern human condition. But that wasn't always the case, and so I thought I'd start tonight by going back in time to a time even before I was making pictures. And so the first picture I'm going to show you here is picture of me with my parents in uh, Cambridge in the late 1970s. I was raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the child of an interracial marriage. And being interracial has really greatly um, shaped who I am. Uh, my experience as a whole, I would call um, culturally and racially ambiguous and, com and complex. And uh, I really sort of embrace that ambiguity. And I'd, when I was younger, I didn't understand how important that learning that 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 uh, that point was. You know, um, it took me a long time, and I think photography also sort of helped me to understand and become aware of how important this was to me and how core it is to my, my central being. Um, basically, you know, because I came from this this background where people were always asking me, okay, well, well, are you black or are you white? And I said, well, no, I'm neither. I'm sort of, you know, people wanted to put me in boxes and I didn't like it. And so I think that sort of transferred to the way I photograph as well. Um, you know, I think some of my projects you know, don't fit neatly into one box or another, but they live in their own space. And that's really important. You know, I, every artist needs to figure out, um, you know, how to locate themselves and I think digging into your personal history and your uh, oftentimes your childhood and your upbringing is really important to figuring out who you are and what your sensibility is. Um, so from uh, you know for, it took me years to figure out figure this out and that this was a way of working that felt really comfortable for me. Um, so my first encounter with photography was way back in 1997. I was just finished in college and I was an African American studies and psychology major. I was studied at Wesleyan University. Um, and I basically just finished my thesis and was pretty much done with the college process. I went down to the university bookstore and was browsing, and I came across this book by Eli Reed called Black in America. And it just mesmerized me because basically what I had just finished a year writing about and you know, theorizing about with words, this photographer was using pictures to describe. And 
I found it so powerful and fascinating that, you know, and I'd never considered that the visual language could be as strong as the written word. And so I sat with this book for a while and, it, you know, it really came at the right time because I didn't know what I was going to do after college. Um, I decided to move to New York and I ended up getting a internship at Magnum Photos here in the city. And my time at Magnum was very important for me because it was my real experience, my, really my first experience with photo history and looking at and learning about the photographic <coughs> process. Um, but after a short time there, it became apparent to me that while all of the, photo all the photographers were making amazing work, I was less interested in the more straightforward documentary and journalistic type work that was coming out of the agency, like, like these sorts of pictures. And instead, I was fascinated by the photographers who are using the camera to create their own visual language and framing the world in new and exciting ways. People like Henri Cartier-Bresson, whose compositions and framing of subjects was just astounding. His images could also be quite metaphorical and psychological. Uh, when I was first learning about his work, I remember reading a quote from him, which just stuck with me. He said, to take a photograph is to align the head, the eye, and the heart. It's a way of life. It was also the first time I saw how the use of color could radically alter the mood, feeling, and meaning of images. And photographers like Alex Webb, Georgi Pinkazov, and Harry Griard were highly influential. They were not simply documenting, but rather using the world as raw source material from which to create their photographs. They seem to be making images from nothing rather than relying on having a really interesting subject or documenting some battlefield. So like many photographers, this early experience was highly impressionable and cemented for me a way of approaching the medium. So I too ventured out into the world reacting and responding to what it had to offer and while my interest and process has evolved, there is still at its core some of these approaches to the medium that remain. In some of my work, you can see the visual language of journalism, but my work is not journalistic, and often my approach is intuitive, reacting to the world around me as a street photographer would, but my current projects are not street photography. But street photography is where I started. Um, when I left Magnum, I began making my own pictures on the street, I had a Leica M6 and had fallen head over heels in love with Kodachrome 200, which was the film a lot of the Magnum photographers were shooting at the time. And there was just something about the way that film uh, rendered the world, which was really, uh, it was intoxicating. The, it, it had this real three-dimensional look to it. Uh, it was thick, it was warm, it was luscious. And it got me really excited about seeing how the world could be me mediated through the act of photographing. And so I was basically thrilled to be photographing anything and everything that I could be. And I was sort of photographing in the way that Gary Winogrand said, to see what the world looked like photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, this time period also saw the emergence of scanning. And those early scanners really hated Kodachrome as much as I loved it. Um, so please excuse some of the quality of these early scans. They were made with their vintage, you know, straight from late 1990s Polaroid scanners. Um, but back then, street photography was not this oversaturated genre as it is today. And there weren't, you know, millions of people and practitioners on the street with digital cameras. Uh, but there was a budding online presence of photographers who were working on the street and, you know, communicating through the internet. And it was an exciting time to be able to share images with people and find community that way. Um, and after a few years of shooting on the street, I joined a street photography collective called In Public. Um, and that community provided me the motivation to keep on shooting and to keep making pictures. So here are some of the photographs I was making early on. Again, you know, really interested in light and color at that time and the way Kodachrome was able to capture these scenes in a way that I hadn't seen other film be able to do. And it was during this time period I was thinking about the psychology of light and color and how combining these forms could create meaningful images. But, you know, just off on the street and making pictures here and there, just really photographing 
anything and everything. But as Kodachrome died out, I started working with digital cameras, and my work became less concerned with color and light, and uh, started to focus more on gesture and psychology. And it's interesting to see how changes in technology directly affect the way that we as photographers relate to work and make work, right? You know, the, the nature of our work can really change based on the technologies that are available. And so I started focusing more on um, you know, these moments, you know, what had started out as just light and color now had turned into exploring images with self-contained and sort of open-ended narratives, images that offered questions uh, but no real answers. Uh, for me, street photo photography provided a great way to explore different sorts of photographic possibilities, but there came a point where it left me wanting, and I wanted the images to add up to something more. I knew I needed to push myself further, or I'd lose interest in photographing entirely, possibly. So I was looking for a way to take the intuitive way I was making work um, and figure out a way to mold those pictures into something that's, that was more substantial. And that's when I discovered the book form. And thinking about my pictures as pieces of fragmented narratives that could be explored within the confines of a book was the next big moment in, for me in my progression as an artist. And so my first book, called This Quiet, uh, started in 2010 with the birth of my son, Satchel, here. And he's now seven. Um, and it goes without saying, though, that you know this time period when you know just ha after having a kid is filled with lots of times you know with family, thinking about family, thinking about life cycles, and so you know because I was around it, that's what I was photographing in you know, my family. I'd never really photographed my family that much before, but I started to make lots of pictures of my family. But that was only part of the story. Um, in 2010, the world that my son was born into was a world that I found uh, troubling. There was a severely de depressed economy. There was the political dysfunction, wars, and climate disasters. And, it, you know, it's funny, you know, comparing it to where we are now, it, it almost looks like child's play, but, you know, it, there, it was, there was a sense of real concern about the state of our union at that time. And because of the experience of becoming a father, I found that all of a sudden I was more aware of how external forces could impact my family's life. And I was in sort of engaged in this internal dialogue where my personal life and experiences of family were weaving and merging and converging with my thoughts on the world I was bringing my son into. And it all began to create a sense of disquiet for me and I wanted to create a project that could reflect these feelings. But it wasn't until the fall of 2011 that the project really came into clear focus for me. I was, at that time, um, well, it's when Occupy Wall Street started um, having some protests. And I started going down to Zuccotti Park at that time, uh, mainly just out of curiosity. I wasn't photographing. I was interested in the movement. And so for a few weeks, I wasn't even making pictures. I was just kind of there to you know, observe and you know, just genuine, genuine curiosity, not a photographic curiosity. But then. I started making some pictures and I had this moment where I realized that I wanted to find a way to create a project where images of, of my family were in a di direct dialogue with what was happening socially, culturally, and politically in our country at the time. Um, but even from the outset, I knew I didn't want this project I was you know, just starting to think about. I didn't want it to be overtly political or journalistic. My hope was that it would convey more of a feeling than be literally descriptive. Um, and as I'm just going to read a little bit of what Marvin Heiverman, the writer and critic, wrote in the essay for the book. He said, photographs, it turns out, don't always offer up smooth surfaces and lucid narratives. As, dr dr uh, sorry, as the dramatic and beautiful images in disquiet re 
disquiet, repeatedly reveal, photographs can throw up speed bumps. Photographs create drag. Instead of enabling you to point at this or this or that, a photograph can make you anxious. Photographs can, quite unexpectedly, grab hold of and destabilize you, cause your intellectual or emotional footing to get shaky and take you to places you'd never intended to go. So, as I'll show you as I go through some of the images in the, the book, um, within the book form, I was able to create a structure where the complex threads of subject matter I was interested in could be woven together. And in the end, I found it wasn't really about creating a book that has photographs like a traditional monograph. It was more about using my photographs to tell a story. And there were a number of strategies I was thinking about as I was putting the, the book together. And so broadly speaking, the book is comprised of a few loose categories. Uh, news images from Occupy Wall Street, environmental portraits, still lives, and landscapes, which combined created the fragmented meditative story that represented the concern and disquiet I was feeling at the time. Um, and in the process of working on the book, it became important to me that the physical book was intimately scaled and roughly the dimensions of a large novel. I wanted it to read and feel like a story. So the main focus of this project really became sequencing and working with pictures and how, you know, the relationships between images. And this part of the photographic process was actually new for me, um, but I quickly found it to be as important, if not more important, than actually making the images. It's where I could take what I shot and really give it control and you know, shape the meaning in the, of the body of work. And I found that once the images were made, I wasn't concerned about them being tied to, or to uh, their indexical or original relationship to the world. I saw them as pieces of a broader descriptive language that I was free to use in whatever way I wanted. And this new outlook was incredibly liberating and has become central to the way I think about photographs, that images are not necessarily as they seem or appear to be, that their meaning is malleable and in the hand of the maker they can change and, and they become fluid. Images could be linked by content, color, geometry, lots of ways really. Black and white photographs were played off against more lush color ones in the book. Pictures were often lit by moon, fire, or lamplight, and the placement of images, large and small, on the pages was carefully syncopated. The important thing was to find a way to flesh out the story and to make the combinations of the images stronger than the individual. So I'll go through some examples to show you what I mean. Uh, so towards the beginning, there's this image of a, an Occupy Wall Street protest with the fire at night followed by this image of a fire red sky. Um, so using the, you know, the language of the fire and as a way to link the images in the book. Or this Occupy Wall Street image that comes later in the book is, uh, segues back into this image of home um, where the smoke sort of from the, the previous image trails into this image bringing that world into my domestic life into the, you know, this image here with my wife in the kitchen, and it creates a relationship between the images. Um, <coughs> themes such as generations and birth and death are introduced in the book and cycle back again throughout the story. This image shows the hand of my dying grandmother, followed by the birth of my son. Here's another example of generations and aging. My son Satchel um, sleeping on the floor, which is followed by this image of a man sleeping on a rock in a fetal position. I was also interested in using the formal aspects of picture making to tell the story just as much as and sometimes more than the actual content of the imagery. Uh, the idea that photography itself has its own language I would use a dark, rich color palette as a way to link images in a color story such as these next few here. Mm -hmm. 
and through the use of lighting, you know, um, thinking about lighting a lot when I was making these images, Cheerios scattered here on the floor actually look sinister ra rather than being just some banal, you know, morning scene. Another example of how I use gesture and body language to connect images. This image of my wife's hand is followed by another image of her reaching out for our son. Uh, most of the pictures in the book were made intuitively, but some were constructed. Um, these next two examples of my wife in the bedroom show both scenarios. This image was something I preconceived. It was, you know, staged, lit, and all that, you know, days in advance. I was thinking about it. While this image was made intuitively, you know, from events as they occurred, my wife had insomnia one night, and so I just reacted. I started making images of her. And a lot of the pictures in this quiet were taken at night, uh, or in the dark, or in bed. And that wasn't a conscious choice. But as the project progressed, I realized it was important in creating the photographic language of the book. The writer, Tom Larringer, uh, wrote about the book for PhotoEye. And he had this quote, which I liked. He said, the darkness of insomnia and other times at night are the periods when it is quiet is the loudest. When life is pervaded by disquiet, the only respite comes in snatches in places where silence is offered up in buckets. And so in photography, you know, areas of darkness and blackness can really be just as meaningful and powerful as areas of detailed description. And I think that's, you know, something I use a lot in my photographs. Um, the theme of inside versus, out, versus outside is constantly revisited in the book. Here's an image of my son, Satchel. He's in a car looking out, but I've photographed him from the outside. And meanwhile, he's in the car looking out, seemingly at this helicopter that's hovering in the sky that comes next in the sequence. Um, and this image sort of reinforces the themes of wariness and watchfulness. Here's another example of a person inside looking out. In this case, my wife, my pregnant wife, Allie. So the Occupy Wall Street images in the book are made from video stills I found of protests. I took the stills and cropped them, changed them to black and white, darkened them, reprinted them on newsprint, and then rescanned them to give them the look and the feel that I was after and to give them a uniformity. I wanted the images to be part of the story, but also to feel like a slightly different voice. Again, reinforcing the idea of, you know, my life versus the, the world outside of my, you know, family's life. It was important that these images feel at once connected, but also distinct from the other images in the book. And I was also thinking about cinema and the idea of cutting between scenes. These images come at certain points, um, maybe every 12 to 14 images in the book. And it's sort of like cutting between you know, my life and then what's happening outside and then back and forth. And um, sorry. So this image here uh, comes right before this next image in the book, which creates an unexpected relationship between these two images. And the wonderful thing I discovered about working with on a photo book and working with, with photographs for a photo book is that by simply placing two images next to each other, you've already created a dialogue between those images. And so sometimes more obvious, Connections can make sense, um, but at other times it's really interesting to see how the mind works to reconcile or find connections between images that, uh, don't, that don't at first seem related to each other. And uh, so a book is a really a great place to, to work with those ideas. Uh, there are images in the book that are you know, a little bit more direct, more about the content rather than you know, conveying a feeling, and such as these next few. Uh, there are just two images in the book that really pinpoint the, the time period in which I was photographing. This is one of them, which an image showing Obama on TV, um, and also this next image of a scattered newspaper, which you know, sort of dates it as being in this time period of Occupy Wall Street. There's an abandoned storefront down near Wall Street. And so having these images interspersed throughout the book helps anchor the themes that I'm after for the viewer. 
And then in contrast, less topical images such as these next few open up and complicate the project. They make the work less overtly political and harder to label as being one specific thing, which was really important to me. But through the use of light and color in the pictures, they also have a direct relationship to the other images in the book. Um, here, this is the last image I'm showing from the project, and I wanted to leave you with a quote from Minor White that helped guide me when I was making and editing and sequencing for the book. Minor White said, sequences of images can exist in order for man to confront himself and will be meaningful in some way to each man alone. Each meaning is right and each meaning is valid. So I love the idea of planting seeds of a narrative or a story, but then leaving room for the viewer to come to their own conclusions. Um, and hopefully each viewer will have a different experience with the work based on their own life experience, which they hopefully actively bring to engaging with a work or a book. Um, the last project I'm going to show you this evening is my most recent book called The Disappearance of Joseph Plummer, and it also started with family connections. And its story begins with my father. Here's a picture of him also in the late 70s. Um, in New Hampshire. Uh, he bought land up there in central New Hampshire and you know, he was looking for a place for peace and quiet in the wilderness. And he designed a house and built it himself on weekends. We would go up, he would sometimes bring volunteers up from Boston, but uh, you know, a lot of my childhood, you know, my three, four, five years, when I was three and four and five years old, we were up there and uh, you know, we'd, we'd two to three weeks at a time, you know, we'd stay in tents and, you know, do the whole camping thing, and my dad would be working on this house. And the land we bought was on a lake called Hermit Lake. This is an aerial view, aerial view of the lake here. A, a fairly small lake. It's south of the lakes region, you know, south of like Lake, lake Winnipesaukee and some of the more major lakes in New Hampshire. Fairly private. Um, but it wasn't until around 2010 that I began to wonder why the lake was called Hermit Lake and why the road that we took to get to the lake was called Hermit Woods Road and I began to do some research and what I discovered was that there was in fact a man who lived secluded in the woods for his whole adult life named Joseph Plummer and as you can see um, his story still resonates today with names of roads you know, the lake and local businesses also. His story and his legend are solidified in the local lore. And what interested me about his story is why it still resonates today. And I think there are two main reasons for this. The first is that, you know, I think throughout history, people have always had a fascination with people who do take that leap to decide to leave society. And it's a pretty radical step. And we're, I think, all. Uh, fantasized, it, uh, fantasized about it at one time or another, but when people actually do it, you're, there's a curiosity about you know what actually enabled them to make that or enabled them to take that step. Um, but secondly, and I think more interestingly, because there are only bits and pieces of information about him and his story, it has allowed his legend to swell. And I'm really in I got interested in this idea of mythology and you know how that works and that this idea became central to my pursuit of the project. The fact that when only small bits and pieces of information are known about someone or something, it actually creates an opportunity for more narrative possibilities. People want to fill in the gaps of a bare bones story. And the only way to do that is to make up the rest, right? Um, this is how mythology works, and it's also similar to how photography works. Um, I actually don't think Photography is necessarily a very good narrative form at all, but that's kind of what interests me about it as a narrative form. It has a lot of holes, it has a lot of gaps, it has a lot of ways for you to play with it. Um, and so I've come to believe that there's tremendous potential for narrative possibilities when information is presented in fragments because it encourages an active imagination. So when I started this project, I knew I wanted that to be at the forefront of 
of what I was thinking about and how I presented the project. And so I started, I Googled Joseph Plummer, and uh, you know, I got lots of pictures of men named Joseph Plummer, mm -hmm. but none were of the man I was looking to find. Uh, but this makes sense because the man I was interested in, uh, his life was bookended by the Revolutionary War on one side and the Civil War on the other. And he left society to live in the woods when he was in, uh, about 20 years old. And so, you know, the first photographs were made sometime in the 1820s. You know, he wasn't really able to be photographed. So without photographs, you know, what else could I find about him? Um, and doing some research, I discovered that uh, my father had, had bought, you know, actually the same land that the hermit used to live on. Mm -hmm. And this was a turning point in the, in the project for me. And I found it really remarkable and it really connected me personally to this man's story. Uh, the, the fact that both Joseph and my dad had picked the same area to find peace and solitude in the woods, I found really interesting and you know, it was one of the main reasons I kept pursuing the project. Um, so, you know, I, I couldn't find a picture of him and so the next place I went was looking for articles, I went to the local historical society and there were some articles that were written about him. Um, I even found newspaper clippings all the way from Washington State from the 1800s that were written about this hermit. Mm -hmm. he, he became quite uh, famous, not just within the region, but nationally at the time. But uh, the stories really started being quite similar. There wasn't a lot of information. That there was basically, all the articles repeated themselves. So there wasn't a lot of information about this, this man. And so I basically was trying to tell this story of an unknowable man and so I approached it from a few different angles and the first was as a discovery you know, I was searching for who this man was knowing that I had you know little to no information about him but I was still interested to see what I could discover through inhabiting the same physical places he did I felt like it would help me channel him across time so just I spent a lot of time um, you know looking for his old house you know and just being in the in the woods where I knew that he had spent his days. And I also knew that I wanted to approach the project in a way that mirrored the realities of his life and his legend. Um, you know, that the book would also be a scattered narrative the way his life seemed to be. Uh, I came across this, this quote here from the curator of the National Gallery um, in London, and I thought it was a great quote which really summed up the way I think about putting together stories at this time. And He said, narratives no longer have to be complete to be meaningful. Photographic storytelling is about networks, nodes, and webs. It's more about networks, nodes, and webs than it is about concise statements. In this world, relationships between images become central. Viewers and artists alike are constantly constructing realities from images, wiring and rewiring like neural networks. So the disappearance of Joseph Plummer also uses text as part of the storytelling structure. And I like how small pieces of text can be used, like kernels of ideas, not giving away or spelling out the meaning of a project, but just gently hinting at and suggesting ways for the viewer to engage with the images. Um, and the bits of text steer the viewer towards certain ideas, but ultimately don't, uh, don't paint a complete picture. Um, but once someone has read something, a quote, it becomes impossible for them not to have that influence how they engage or, you know, read other images or understand other images in the book. And so the book opens with a sequence of three images of a mysterious figure walking into the woods. And it's the most straightforward sequence in the book and also the most cinematic. And I see the sequence as an invitation for the viewer to follow the figure and to go ahead and get lost with him. And while I had ideas for the outline of this project, I approach all of my projects very intuitively and I'm open to chance. And I'm still mostly constructing stories from what life has to offer me rather than setting up or making elaborate prearrangements. And that's kind of how this, this came about here. I found this old book of poems in my dad's cabin 
and uh, you know I was struck by it. It was a lot about nature and landscapes, but I was also um, started just one day, you know, hand erasing and words and playing with the words of the poems and liked how using text as a way to reveal and conceal um, was similar to how I was using photographs and identity in the book with revealing and concealing and playing with that with, with that with that idea in the book and it also hints at the fact that you know I'm very much engaged in shaping the story I want to tell by physically intervening on the documents and photographs in the making. As the book unfolds, the first image the viewer sees is of a desolate snowy landscape. Uh, the snowy images from the intro connect to this landscape, and I, I hope that we can imagine that this is to be the terrain of the hermit Joseph Plummer. But again, while I had a framework for the project, I was photographing intuitively, not knowing if or how the images I, images I was making would you know, factor into the larger project. For instance, in this picture, it's a picture of a painting on the wall of a residence in Sam Borton, New Hampshire, near where the hermit lived. Um, and I've used it as a stand-in for the hermit's house. But I also like how it gets at the idea of the idealistic wooded setting that is cemented in our collective conscience. And also, it's I just it's so funny how this happens so often. You'll be somewhere you know, in this really beautiful landscape, and you'll be in this house, and they'll just have a picture of what's right outside. And I never understood that phenomenon. Uh, to locate the viewer, I've included a map of the area, but I've erased the names of the towns so that you don't know exactly where you are. Again, wanting you to get a little lost yourself. Um, that image of the map is followed by, of the, the map of Hermit Lake is followed by this image of Hermit Lake at night. And this image feels like it could be, you know, holding some secrets. And as I mentioned, I, you know, a big turning point was bringing my dad into this story. And once I had been pursuing the project for a while, I realized that it wasn't just about Joseph Plummer, it was about my dad and ultimately myself. And I realized that the reason my dad bought the land was because of his fantasy to slip away. You know, he had the same motivations as Joseph. And I hadn't really intended to, but I started to photograph my dad and also his belongings, his cabin, his tool, his wood pile, um, his figure in the woods, and insert them into the, the story. And ultimately, the project became about the two of them and not just the original hermit. So the narrative starts with Joseph Plummer and segues to my father about two-thirds of the way through the book. And as, so as I mentioned, I was working with the Historical Society on this project, and they were really great, you know, they had giving me all the clippings of newspapers, and um, they also gave me access to their whole archive of material. Um, so every photograph that they had of, you know, people from the town and the landscapes from the surrounding area, they gave me free um, rain on. And so I would spend, you know, weeks at a time sorting through the material that they had there, looking for images that I would like to use, because it was important to me that the archival images be, you know, from the actual community and have some connection to the story in that way. So. I didn't actually get a chance to go up to New Hampshire as much as I would like from New York, you know, having small children and all that. So on the, I would go up a few times a year. Um, I would make a lot of images and, you know, go to the historical society and take the images that I wanted to, to work with. And then I'd bring them home and I'd spend the rest of the year editing and sequencing and playing with their physical form. And the part where I was playing with the form of these historical <laughs> images was a new step for me. I'd never intervened on my images before, but I found it really playful and fun and rewarding. And I think as artists, we all always need to figure out ways to keep playing and experimenting with our process or else, you know, the passion for working can really start to fade away pretty quickly. Um, so the idea of light or glow representing Joseph is something that I thought about often when I was photographing for this project. And when I was off in the woods, there were a lot of times when I would see this magical glowing light, and I imagined that it was Joseph reaching across time. The glow, the glow repeats a few places in the book and represents his permanent presence in the woods. But at this early stage in the book, this image comes near the beginning of the book. It also represented his sort of fade into anonymity. 
here's a contemporary image of um, a contemporary road sign you know, indicating that Hermitwood's Road uh, you know, is still alive and present today, you know, but lets you know, so it references the hermit. And I was thinking about the idea that there was both a man and a story enshrouded and hidden in the woods, and so I was making collages to represent that idea. And, you know, as I mentioned, starting to photograph tools that belonged to my dad and also um, some of the tools that they had at the Historical Society, which they said belonged to the actual hermit, which I don't know if it's, you know, what is actually true and what's not, but, you know, I like that aspect of the project. Uh, this is the hermit's decision box, and supposedly he had uh, white and black beans that he would put in this box, and, you know, he'd have a question, he'd shake up the box, roll out a bean, and that's how he'd decide you know, what to have to have for dinner that night or whatever the question was. Another tin box that was supposedly recovered from his, the, the, the site of his house. Another image where I physically intervened, again playing with the images from the archive over the year when I wasn't able to get up to New Hampshire. An image of my dad's cabin in the woods here. Uh, my father's axe, which is followed by this image here in the book um, of these axe marks in, the, in a log, which I see as maybe also representing the number of years that Joseph was secluded in the woods. I could imagine him, you know, uh, you know making a mark once a year just to, to keep track of time. Um, and so it was great working on this project with, with my dad, but he's not really one for acting and doesn't like to be in front of the camera. So he was basically perfectly in character. Um, sometimes I'd pose him, uh, like in this image, and it, it was like pulling teeth. It was hard, it was hard working with him. He's, it was not something he was comfortable doing. Um, but basically he was happy to do it as long as we were both off in the woods that we were growing to love and appreciate together as we were working on this project together. An image of Hermitwood roads at night. Um, and so there's a sequence in the book about two thirds of the way through where I see the original hermit spirit fading away and being reborn as my father. And it starts with this image here at night which is followed by this image in the sequence, and it's the first spread in the book where a contemporary image is paired with a historical image. And, you know, my dad seems to be lighting this history on fire, um, basically, you know, erasing Joseph's life and metaphorically erasing his presence. And it's followed by this image uh, of this bear that comes walking towards us out of the woods at night which I sort of see as a Joseph's metamorphosis. Um, and from there, there's also this idea of a duality that, en that enters the project, a place where there are two existences, two characters, you know, basically living, you know, and experiencing the same land, maybe going through some of the same rituals, but having a slightly different experience with it because they're in different time periods. So images like this in the book where it's a waterfall that near Joseph's house that, you know, is important both, I'm sure, to Joseph because he built his house near there and to my dad as well. Um, but, you know, they're slightly different images showing that, uh, you know, there's this sort of twinning happening, but the, 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 they're having similar experiences but not quite exactly the same. And so actually when I went out to find Joseph's house the first time, uh, where he was, where his, the site of his house is actually also where he's buried. And people at the Historical Society told me how to get there. And for the first three times I went, I got lost. I spent hours and hours in the woods looking and I couldn't find the location. But I made a lot of images during that process and then, uh, you know, created these composites that there are a few of them in the book as a way to illustrate this idea of, you know, getting lost in the woods myself. Um, here's another example of an image that I've intervened on at the site of Joseph's uh, 
first house, in this case sewing the photograph to indicate the original location of Joseph's cabin. Um, this image here references the regional nature of the work. If you know the area in you know, New Hampshire, this is an image of the man in the mountain, um, which was up in the White Mountains region of New Hampshire. But uh, unfortunately, this rock face, this facade, has cr crumbled within the last decade or so. Um, so it's no longer there. And I also kind of like that, that you know, this man who was the face of New Hampshire, his, his identity has crumbled as well. But you know, if you don't get that reference to New Hampshire, that's also OK with me. <laughs> this last image um, I'm showing here is a handmade collage in the book that brings the story back to winter the same way that the book starts. And it signals that the story might repeat over and over again with new characters and new periods of time. And I thought I'd end with this passage from Leo Su's review of the book for Fraction Magazine. He wrote, the mix of images would be disoriented if it were not so confident in its own logic. There are historical photographs, photographs of objects, photographs apparently from Willett's own family archive and Willett's own photographs in black and white and in color, solid and blurred, measured and delirious. Trees, cordwood, the end of the day. Willett builds a visual language, which he then manipulates with later images calling back to earlier ones, twinned images and photographs that have been sewn and burned. Every image intrigues and invites contemplation. In the sequence, they run together at once concise and expansive. Each new image feels familiar, echoing the feel of those that came before. By the time we reach the latter part of the book, we are led to wonder whether we are the hermit as, and Willett has escorted us with photographs and text into this dark and mysterious world. This could be your story too, Will It seems to offer. So that's my lecture. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming out tonight to listen. And I thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, so you must be considering your next project, and I wonder if um, you're looking at doing even more sort of uh, altered things between digital and uh, traditional means of photography and you know what what's on your mind for next go around for next for next projects <laughs> well um, yeah I am working on something that's next it, it doesn't specifically have to do with uh, referencing different kinds of media but in my work I do use analog photography digital photography I you know cell phones whatever it doesn't really matter just to me the important thing is making the images that you know can be assembled to tell a story so I don't get too concerned with the me you know the the media the, the capture device or the way it's being mediated but um, I'm open to, to using everything um, the, the next project I'm working on is I've also done a lot a lot of work on underground railroad sites in America and it the next uh, the project I'm working on is a little bit more about race in America. Hello, um, thank you. Um, creating a, a narrative like this, how how do you know you're done? <laughs> 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 like, yeah, that's, that's, one. that's a really interesting question. I I think I think you you I'm quite obsessive, so you know. In fact, you could all, in some ways never be done, but um, there's a point where you where I, I reach where I know all the changes I'm making, they're not really making it better or worse, they're just kind of making it different, you know? So it could go on forever, but you just have to, uh, there becomes a, a, yeah, a time where I realize that it's not really being productive, all the playing I'm doing, that I'm, I'm done. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much for your time tonight. Uh, one thing you said that really resonated with me is uh, viewing photography as sort of an incomplete narrative, and that's something you like about it, and mm -hmm. that's something I like about it as well, but I'm curious that in allowing the audience to fill in those gaps, are you ever worried about um, misconceptions or misconstruing of the idea that you put forth, or is that not even a concern? Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, I'm not too concerned with that. That's part, you know, I was reading that quote by Minor White earlier in the presentation, you know, the idea that you can put 
sequences of images into the world and the viewer is going to have whatever experience they're going to have with them you know and i like that you know when i w watch a, a movie or read a book the most interesting conversations are when you have with people and you you have slightly different opinions on what's going on or slightly different takes so i really do welcome that um, i want to have some you know obviously i do have motivations and i know what my motivations are but i'm hoping that they're a starting point as well and that the viewer will will help flush out the experience by, um, by with with their own experiences. So on a, a very practical note, how did you, you know, you've got the project, you've got the book, the layout, maybe a book dummy. How mm -hmm. do you get to the next step so it's not just like under your bed? <laughs> well, um, yeah, just from a very practical standpoint, yeah. I mean, you know, the the, the landscape has dramatically changed even between the time that I published my first book, which is in 2013, and then my second book in 2017. The amount and, not, and sheer number of photo books that are being produced is staggering now. I mean, so the, you know, trying to get a publishing deal, and then on top of that, you know, just trying to get anyone to, to look at it when there's so many books out there is not, is not you know, necessarily that easy. But it's also, you know, that being said, that's also, it's a really exciting time because photo the, the, the sophistication with which photographers are using the book form, um, it's just staggering now. It's really, really elevated so, so quickly. Uh, but, you know, once I finish a project, you know, when I, when I, with my first project, you know, I, I hadn't published a book before, so I just had two or three dummies, physical dummies, and I had a PDF. And I just, you know, was researching online, looking for publishers that had published things that I liked, and I thought, you know, might understand what I was doing, and just started contacting people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just on a very practical level. That's. Yep. It takes, you know, and you know, make the list be closer to a hundred rather than <laughs> five, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah, and try to just uh, meet with publishers if you can. Um, and then the second time around, it was a little bit easier, you know, to, to find people who were interested. Right. So. And there's a, a lot of different models, you know, you, you can self-publish, you know, whereas, you know, 20 years ago that was probably frowned upon, but now, I mean, it, there's a lot of, it's almost like when in, indie music, you know, back in the 90s started, you know, it's, I guess this thing it had a lot of cred credibility and, you know, self-publishing now, you can do a lot that you can't do with the traditional publisher. You can take a lot more risks. And make some, you know, more interesting object than a traditional publisher might be willing to do. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to go, and it doesn't have a, really have a stigma anymore to it at all. So um, I wouldn't be shy about self-publishing. The problem is distribution. Hey, Imani, did you uh, think at all of Thoreau uh, going out into the woods, and, and where did that come up in your project? Yeah, it's interesting, you know. Once the book was in the world, people asked me a lot about that, you know, this, this tradition of, you know, men going off into the woods or transcend transcendentalism, you know, throw and all these, this, this rich history. But for me, this, per this story was actually much more personal than that. It wasn't, it didn't really factor into the equation. Obviously, uh, as the project went al along, I started reading some things just to see if there was something I would want to add to the story. Um, but it really did not have its, you know, it, 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 that wasn't the impetus for the project and that wasn't the interest for the project. So it stayed much more personal than that. And, you know, in fact, I was looking at throw and some quotes and it's like, oh, well, maybe should I put something in? But it just it even felt disingenuous because it didn't really feel like it was connected. Okay, well, I know that uh, our students have to get back to work. <laughs> and um, there's tables downstairs covered in small prints, just like you showed. And um, I want to thank you very much. It's very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs>